Good evening and welcome everyone to our first winter stewardship talk of 2024. I'm Ben Vanderweide. I'm the Natural Area Stewardship Manager for Oakland Township Parks. Uh, we're so glad you're all here tonight. Um, we're uh, happy to welcome Kim and Eno for our talk. Uh, I started here about 10 years ago and um, nine years ago <laughs> I got to know Kim. And uh, Kim is the former owner of Halfway Down the Stairs uh, Bookstore in Rochester. So a lot of folks, I would, uh, you know, get to know them. And they'd say, oh, yeah, I know Kim. She owned that bookstore for the longest time. <laughs> so she has deep, deep roots in this community. And when she retired, she just couldn't sit still. Uh, and something that's impressed me so much about Kim is that she always wants to learn and understand more. And you've probably picked up on this in your blog posts, like her insatiable curiosity um, and the excitement that she shares with everyone. And I'm so excited that we get to hear her story tonight and she's willing to share it with us. Um, I'm sure she'll tell you more, but just for an example, she wanted to share her story. So she learned PowerPoint so she could do that. <laughs> At age 76. Not yeah, crazy. never used PowerPoint before, but she decided she was going to take it on so she could share her story. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Kim Menino. Um, I'll hand it over to you, Kim, and I'm okay. going to handle some tech stuff. Okay. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Let's thank welcome you. Kim. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for being here. I see all kinds of friendly faces, which really helps when you're working with your first PowerPoint. Um, and I see some faces I don't know and hope to meet you before the end of the evening. So thank you for being here. As Ben said, I volunteered at Oakland Township Park Stewardship Program for almost nine years. It'd be in March. Um, and during that time, the things you've heard about tonight are the things I've been doing. I've been gathering, I've been working on citizen science projects, basically, peeking in bird boxes to, to count baby bluebirds and dipping in woodland pools to find fairy shrimp and fingernail clams who knew we had shrimp and clams uh, in our township. Um, and spending very quiet autumn mornings with a lot of nice people just taking the seed, uh, taking the seed off the stem and saving it for putting in other parks. But most of my volunteer time is writing the nature blog on the township's um, stewardship website at Natural Areas Notebook. What I do is I visit several parks throughout the year. We have 11 that I can go to. And I take photos of what's blooming, what's flying, what's buzzing, what's growing, whatever, in that park at that time. And then I research what I've seen because the stewardship website is a science website. It's not a photo blog, you know. Um, and I love the research because that's where I learn everything that I'm curious about. Because when you take a picture of some strange looking bug you never saw before, you want to know what it is, you know. So then I put the photos in that I've taken. And nowadays there are friends who help me and let me use their photos. And um, then I, after I write it, I give it to Ben and Ben um, edits it for me for accuracy um, so that I'm not telling anybody anything that's wildly off base. And that's then it's published each month. But I'm so I'm here tonight not as an expert because I am no expert. I'm an enthusiastic volunteer um, sharing what I've learned. And as I said, this is only the second time I've orally presented this material and my second time wrangling PowerPoint. So if you can, please save your questions till the end because I may never find my way back in if I stop <laughs> to answer a question. Um, I'm happy to answer whatever I can, but Ben's here too, and he'll answer more depth in more depth than I can. I've lived off and on in Oakland Township since I was four years old. I can't make this move again, Ben, let me see. Oops, wrong place. No, I found it. I'm just going in the wrong place. I'm not used to your computer yet. I've lived off and on here since I was four years old. My parents moved here from Detroit in 1951. So to save you the the uh, mental math, I'm 70, going to be 77. And um, after, and I loved it here. I spent a lot of time in the large maple trees along Lake George Road. And um, that landscape has always been part of my life. After I graduated from college, I lived in some very beautiful places. I lived in Louisville, Kentucky. I lived in San Francisco and I lived in New Zealand. But amazingly, I had to always come back to this landscape and to my family, of course. But I love this landscape. It nourished me, has nourished me all my life. And my husband and I have lived here now for over 30 years. So after, as Ben said, after I retired from halfway down the stairs, I, I kind of took my, my camera and just started walking it only in Bear Creek. I didn't even explore the rest of the parks initially. I just went to Bear Creek because it's close to where I lived. 
And I somehow that got me connected with coming to a workshop that Ben did in 2015. And um, it was called something related to uh, using prescribed fire to renew prairies or something like that. And I mean, it was like, OK, fire renews I, I, plants. This is this is fairly new to me. I knew a little bit, you know, people mentioned, might have mentioned it, but prairies really confused me. So I came, of course, because I was curious. And Ben started out by holding up his hand like this, you know, and he said, now, this part, you've seen this gesture before if you live in Michigan, right? Mm -hmm. um, the prairie went kind of went, there was tall grass prairie in Michigan before the colonists arrived. There was tall grass prairie in Michigan from here up to where we live, from the southwest up to where we live. And I was like, wait a minute. I was raised to think I lived in a forested state. I didn't know I lived in a tall grass prairie. I was just amazed by that. And, you know, I'd always associated tall grass prairies with Laura Ingalls Wilder, you know, out in Kansas and Missouri. And so Ben described these prairies. He said they were tall, tall grass, wildflowers, rolling, you know, landscape, widely spaced oaks and hickories. And so he got me imagining prairies. So what I'd like to do now is try to get you to imagine these ancient prairies. Um, and to do that, I'm going to show you this photo just to get you started. Let's see here if I can make this work. There we go. A man named C.F. Hoffman came to our area in 1835 and he described what he saw. He wrote in, in a journal. I'd like to read you what he wrote then, but I wanted to show you this picture. It's a picture, uh, it's a restoration that Ben and his team have been working on at Charles Ilsley Park that will give you an idea, help you imagine what Mr. Hoffman saw in 1835. He said this, clumps of the noblest oaks with not a twig of underwood, extending over a gently undulating grassy surface as far as the eye can reach. Here clustered together in a grove of tall stems supporting one broad canopy of interlacing branches and there rearing their gigantic trunks and solitary grandeur from the plain. Isn't that wonderful 19th century language? And um, I lost my place here. Hold on a second. I want to go back. Did the wrong thing. There we go. Sorry. So in this photo, obviously, not so many trees uh, then as there are now, but tall grass and wildflowers and the gigantic oak rearing up out of the plain. So these tall grass prairies, very interestingly, whoops, that does it again. Here we go. Come on, move. Okay, move now. Oh, Ben, I can't get out of your computer thing here. Can you help me? I can't get it to go where I want it to go. I just want to go to the next thing. How do I get that out? Oh, okay. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, sir. So these tall grass, grass prairies with their sparse trees were repeatedly burned by lightning over thousands of years before humans ever arrived. I mean, just kind of imagine that. A fire gets going in that era, right? Those thousands of years. Nothing stops it. It burns until it runs into water, rain, a lake, a river. And then according to their traditions, the Nanishnabic people arrived here from the east between 900 and 1400 AD or CE, whichever you like to call it. And they brought fire with them because they were a fire culture. They used it for clearing land. They used it for important cultural ceremonies, for attracting game. They would burn the grass. New tender grass would come up and the deer would come to them instead of them having to go to the deer. And they understood that by burning the crops in the fields, they were renewing them. Now, some prairie plants kept coming back after fires. The ancestors of uh, our, then those are the ancestors of our hardy native plants. So my question then was, well, how did they do that? How did they survive these fires? And do they do it today? And it turns out that prairie plants grow very, very deep roots. It can take up to three years before they fully bloom because they're growing, busy growing roots in order to survive heavy winters, droughts in the summer, and fire. Many native trees, like this little tiny oak, if you can maybe see it, it's not too, too easy to see, but it's right about there in the plains. That tree would has grown, all oaks grow, have grown, got fire adapted, have grown thicker bark. So they may scorch in a fire, but they don't catch fire very easily. And this one didn't catch fire. 
because you can see its bud came out the next spring perfectly well. I went to check it because I was there when it was burning and I wanted to make sure it was okay. So it turns out that fire actually helped those ancient survivors, just as it does our native plants today. Blackened soil holds the heat and that makes the, the growing season longer. It warms the soil and it makes the growing season longer. So if you, especially of course, if you're doing it in the spring. Burning the dead plants, the thatch of the previous year, uh, leaves room for new seedlings to find ground to grow in but it also fertilizes the soil by releasing all the nutrients that were in the dead plants back into the soil. And some of our native plants are so used to fire that they can't germinate without fire. So the prairie fire survivors produced generation after generation, and they became what we now call fire adapted. They come back quickly after fire and they flourish. So you'll see in this presentation that carefully controlled fire is an important part of prairie restoration. So then I wanted to know, <laughs> Ben's answered a lot of questions for me over the last nine years. How, how does Ben or any conservationist really know which plants are actually native? Well, it turns out that in 1816 and 17, when Michigan was part of the Northwest Territories, the federal government sent out a surveyor by the name of Joseph Wampler. And a descendant of his is in the back row just tonight. Uh, <laughs> this is Andrea Wampler. Who, uh, who married one of the Wamplers who were here and that were related to this man. He came here and he plotted Oakland Township and the sections within it. That's his notebook, which can be found online. And he walked each section line within the township and he recorded what he saw at marker points, a wetland, a swamp, good timber, what species they were, et cetera. Shortly after Michigan became a state in the mid 1830s, the state decided, the legislature decided to have a natural uh, resources survey done for the state. They were more interested in salt and things they could sell, but they also did a quarter of it was botany. And then there, the list that came from that and other surveys and the private botanical collections. During the 19th century, there were a lot of amateur enthusiasts with botany and they would send samples of what was on their land to the University of Michigan, and eventually to the Michigan State University for their herbariums. And that's how we know which plants are native, meaning they were seen here in the early 19th century before colonization really got going. That's the rule for native. I mean, the, the people that were here, the Anishinaabe people were not importing plants from other places, you know, they were dealing with the plants that were here. Now I want you to hear from the journal of a 19th century botanist who was in our area later than C.F. Hoffman, the man who talked about the giant oaks. In 1872, a guy named Dr. Bela Hubbard on an, was on an expedition to Pontiac. I think that's really quite fun to think <laughs> about an expedition to Pontiac. He reminisced about what he'd seen in the old days, you know, how the landscape had changed. I, I sympathize with him. I do that a lot myself. The landscape he saw in 1872 might have looked more like the Ojibwe prairie in Windsor that's in this photo. Some sunny spots like you see in the background, some shady spots, um, an endless rolling prairie. It wasn't with a few trees. It wasn't like that anymore. Dr. Hubbard wrote this in 1872 about the oak openings, the term at the time for what we, we now call oak savannas is what but then you would technically call them. And I call them just prairies or tall grass prairies. So let me see if this will pop up. Whoops, it didn't pop up. I don't know why that's not working. Here we are again. Let me get out of there. There we go. Whoops. Ah, he, he, back. Let's go back a little ways here. Back, back, back. There we go. This is what he wrote. He wrote, it appeared to me the most beautiful the sun ever shone upon. It was of the character then beginning to be classed as openings, characterized by gravelly soil and a sparse growth of oaks and hickories. I speak in the past tense because Though the rural beauty of the country is still unrivaled, little remains of the original character of the openings. Now, that was in 1872. Can you imagine what Mr. Hubbard would be saying today? Um, so, so what had happened between 1835 and 1872? Well, obviously, the colonists brought farming, gardening, and cattle, and non-native seeds that they needed to do that. And later, landscape designers in the 19th century horticulturists began to bring in exotic plants. 
from other places. But most importantly, what was missing in the prairie landscape after the colonists arrived was fire. Farmers wanted to plow the prairies to grow the crops and graze the animals, so they kept fire off the landscape as much as possible, of course. That was what they felt they had to do. And that fire suppression and farming went on for 150 years, which gave trees and shrubs and non-native plants a great chance to take over the prairies. Now, in the first years that I worked with Ben, it became clear to me that for some reason, stewardship and restoration required reducing the non-native plants in remaining natural areas and reintroducing or encouraging native plants. And I didn't get that at first. I'm, I'm a slow learner. You're probably ahead of me here. I, I, I just thought, why were native plants any better for our fields and woods than non-native plants? All plants do photosynthesis, right? Non-native wildflowers produce nectar and pollen. So what was so special about native plants and why restore the native plants that thrived here 200 years ago? We're not just trying to do something historical here, are we? Well, it turned out there are a bunch of reasons. <clears throat> Wait a minute, I didn't go far enough down here. Let's see, whoops, sorry, sorry. Still learning this. So it, it whoops, did I not go down? Let me see. I thought I was through with that one, Let's see. Yep, I was, I was right. So it turned out actually there were a lot of reasons that native plants are better, but the one that really clicked for me finally, as I say, a little slow here, was this, that as native plants had been replaced by non-natives, the number of insects and their young, the caterpillars, keep in mind that caterpillars are important here. I know I grew up in the era when any caterpillar or bug for that matter was usually sprayed or squished, you know, but caterpillars turn out to be very important. The number of insects and their young, the caterpillars, have disappeared along as, as, as native plants have disappeared as, right along with them. What we're experiencing worldwide is a world insect decline. It's, some people call it the insect apocalypse. Now, why, I then ask myself, why care about insects like this little native furrow bee with its pollen jodhpurs? I just love it. Well, pollination is obviously the most thing, the most obvious thing. A large percentage of the food we eat and that other animals eat relies on insect pollination to reproduce, right? But another important reason clicked into place for me when I went to my first Michigan wildflower conference, thanks to Ben, and heard entomologist Doug Tallamy, the author of this amazing book, Bringing Nature Home, speak. And if you haven't read this book or you don't own this book, make sure you get this book. If you're at all interested in this subject, it's so an amazing book and so easy to read. He showed so powerfully that caterpillars, the offspring of our important pollinators, are, as E.O. Wilson, the biologist once said, the little things that run the world. Mm. They provide multiple kinds of services to any habitat, but the main one is that they're a crucial step in the beginning of any food web. We need to restore native plants in our landscape because every food web in the world starts with its native plants. Native plants obviously harvest, harvest the energy of the sun through photosynthesis, turning light into edible food in the form of leaves. We're all eating, eating sunlight. Caterpillars are by far the most numerous creatures that eat leaves in the world. They're the most numerous ones. Then they get eaten, eaten in turn, and they pass the sun's energy out into the food web to the rest of us. Caterpillars, like the young of the amazing great spang spangled fritillary, who spends his time in Oakland Township in the summer, are an essential food for a huge percentage of the world's wildlife. Only 10%, though, of our native caterpillars are generalists who can eat both non-native and native, like the black swallowtail can do that. He eats dill, the caterpillar of the black swallowtail eats dill, which is a non-native plant. But 90% of our caterpillars have to be specialists. They can only eat a few particular native plants with which they evolved. So when native plants disappear, so do the things, so do the pollinators and their young, the caterpillars. And as they disappear, Frogs disappear, turtles disappear, fish and salamanders, anything who eats insects young begins to disappear. Many mammals even eat insects and so on out in the food web. 
But let's take an example close to my heart, and I bet yours too, the importance of caterpillars feeding birds and their young. Baby birds like these three-day-old bluebirds have scrawny little necks. The, the parent birds need soft, squishy food full of protein and fat to stuff down those fragile, wrinkled little necks. You know? Now, the female bluebird on the right is clearly either feeding herself, <laughs> from she's running around trying to do all this, or she's feeding her young. The male oriole on the left is no doubt feeding caterpillars to his young, and on the right, of course, the Phoebe fledglings are begging for caterpillars. Here's the problem. It takes a gigantic amount of caterpillars to feed our native birds, as well as those who migrate here from all over the world in order to be here when all of our insects come out in the spring and summer. Get this, when Doug Tallamy, who wrote this wonderful book, his research found that one pair of chickadees, that count them, that's two chickadees, need to collect 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to feed just one clutch of nestlings for one season. Now, how many birds are in your yard? How many birds are there in our parks? Um, it's clear to me that it's not just the chickadees. The vast majority of birds you see feed their young and themselves. On caterpillars, they even do it during the winter because they eat frozen ones out of the crevices in the bark and within the hollow plant stems that you leave in your garden, we hope. Seeds are an important addition, of course, so we're glad you have your bird feeder, but the easily processed protein and fat in caterpillars is crucial. Who knew? So my next question, of course, is probably yours too, which is, well, why can't the caterpillars just eat the leaves of non-native plants? That, we had, that they find in our gardens and in our unrestored areas. Well, what we've learned is that caterpillars have to be picky eaters. 90% of our caterpillars are specialists who can only eat certain native plants. We refer to them as their host plant, their caterpillar host plant, because they can eat that particular plant. If they eat the leaves of non-native and invasive plants, they either die or are deformed in ways that don't allow them to mature. You'll see adult butterflies, right? For instance, sipping nectar from non-native flowers in your garden, but their offspring, our native caterpillars, can only eat native plants. Okay, the question then becomes, why can't they eat non-native plants? Well, this is something I really did not know until I started working with Ben. All plants produce toxins to deter particular predators with which they evolved. So 90% of caterpillar young of our native butterflies and other pollinators have to be specialists. So over thousands of years, right, they evolved to tolerate the toxins of just certain plants, and those are the only ones they can eat. So say Miss Monarch happens to lay her eggs on a non-native plant like this butterfly bush, her caterpillars will either starve from not eating edible food, or be too, not finding any edible food, be too deformed to reach maturity, or die from being poisoned by the toxin in the butterfly bush. Because over the millennia, monarch caterpillars only developed a tolerance to one, the, spe the toxin of one species, which is milkweed. Unless, of course, so without knowing it, I just want to reiterate, our pollinator gardens are doing a fine job of feeding adult butterflies, but sadly, they are killing off, they are starving the offspring of, the, of, those, cat, of those butterflies, their caterpillars. Unless, of course, we plant a healthy number of native plants nearby, which I'm hoping some of you already do, and I know many of you already do, and, and or are at least considering doing. But the other problem with non-native plants is they have the unfortunate ability to spread rapidly into natural areas. Longwood Gardens, which is a famous garden, and you may have heard of it in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, discovered in a study that one spear, just one spear of that butterfly bush we just saw, can produce 40,000 seeds that travel on the wind. They can spread quickly to nearby natural areas. It's a big advantage to have that many seeds dispersed, but non-native plants have another big advantage over our native ones. They left all their predators animals, insects, and fungi that eat them back in their native lands in Europe and in Asia. 
So they can grow and spread more easily because they have no or very few predators to eat them. Our native plants have continued to have to, to contend with a range of native predators. And so some of them do get eaten. As a result of these advantages for invasive plants, restoration often requires removing dense thickets of non-native shrubs like privet and buckthorn and autumn olive and multiflora rose. Because they can so quickly bank this blanket an area, non-native shrubs and vines can crowd out or shade out our native plants. Here's another example showing a trail at Bear Creek before and after removing a tunnel of non-native shrubs. The restored landscape on the right looks to me like it's breathing. It's more varied, it's more open and healthy. And to my eye, it's just much more natural and beautiful. And eventually we'll get some native shrubs if we, have a if we are lucky coming up. Some invasive plants create other problems. Invasive bittersweet, it's a vine, left its predators behind in Asia. Now this, this particular vine doesn't grow vertically on the tree trunks like our comparatively harmless Virginia creeper. It winds around the tree's trunk and strangles it. Or it climbs quickly upward to reach the sun, making the top of the tree heavy and the next windstorm down goes the tree. And I have seen this, Ben has seen this, just trees laying on the ground covered in bittersweet. So, I've tried to explain that that's why we need to restore native plants in any landscape. They feed the habitat in which they evolved and they are still beautiful as well. Whereas non-native plants may be beautiful, but they do nothing to feed anything in their environment, or at least practically nothing. I should be a little fair to them. There's probably a few that feed some, you know. Now for the how, whoops, I did it again here. Whoops, Ben, I'm having trouble. There we go. I began to learn more about how, I wanted to know how this, these restorations were actually done. And there were plenty of opportunities as you saw tonight. I'll share with you two different parks with two different sorts of restorations. The first will be the wet prairie on the Paint Creek Trail. You can see that blue arrow. It's between Gallagher and Silver Bell. It's a place uh, where some unusual, uh, uncommon, rare even flowers, have struggled to survive over a hundred years in drastically reduced numbers after remarkable human intervention. But they're still there and we need to help them and we are helping them. Then if there's time, I'll share another kind of restoration. I think there'll be time uh, called prairie seeding where agricultural and cattle, grains, uh, cattle grazing has prevented native plants from reemerging. Now, whoops, I did it again. In those uh, landscapes, uh, like Charles Ilsley Park, which is up at, near Predmore Road, um, the site is cleared of non-natives and then reseeded with native Michigan prairie seed. Now this is the wet prairie on the Prank Creek Trail. Notice the very flat sunny area along the trail, partially surrounded by a horseshoe shaped berm. To understand that landscape, I'll share with you its absolutely remarkable history. In 1871, the Detroit and Bay City Railroad began work on a rail line along what, what is now Paint Creek Trail. This is a picture of Goodison taken in the 1920s, much later than 1871. But you can see the railroad track running across, uh, running along behind the grist mill, which in the 1950s became this cider mill that we're sitting in tonight. And out there is running the Paint Creek Trail, which is where the bed was of the railroad. Building that railroad track required some drastic, drastic changes at that wet prairie site. Here's the original stream bed of Paint Creek, which in 1871 still meandered through the woods north, just north of the West Prairie, right on the trail. This photo was taken by me in 2020, but Paint Creek doesn't run there anymore. The ancient creek bed now is filled only with rainwater, snow water, and groundwater. The stewardship team and volunteers discovered it while clearing the woods of non-native shrubs, which I'll show you later. When the railroad decided to put in a rail line, they decided they needed to move Paint Creek itself. So they did. The railroad company moved Paint Creek to a trench that they dug east of the railroad bed where it still runs today. And it's been cutting down that trench now uh, since they did that in 1871. It was quite a shock to the wet prairie, as you might imagine. 
uh, the hydrology of the whole area, which the plants depended on, was suddenly very different. But that wasn't the only drastic change we humans made at the at the wet prairie. Whoops, I did it again. I have the darndest time with that thing. I'm just not used to that from my computer. There we go. 50 years later, in the 1920s, another dramatic change occurred along the track. An ambitious local landowner who owned the wet prairie site at the time began mining sand and gravel along the railroad line. The land at the wet prairie was dug out to get to the sand and gravel, which was then loaded onto rail cars and sold in Detroit. So here again is the wet prairie. It's really just a prairie remnant, but a very unusual one. Because of the extreme removal of so much soil, the water table on that flat piece of ancient prairie is very close to the surface and it's mineral rich. It has a lot of calcium. The berm is probably like the worn down version of what was piled up during the excavation 100 years ago. The seedbed must have been decimated. But the mineral rich soil meant that some native wildflowers in the 1920s, the ones that thrived on mineral rich moisture, could begin to repopulate there. Ben's understanding is that in the 1920s, those plants must have been quite abundant, abundant enough that once this land, the mining stopped, they could repopulate from the area around the wet prairie. And that may explain the presence of these very unusual species that weren't so unusual before 1920, but are extremely unusual now that are in the wet prairie. And they're the ones I'll show you tonight. Did it again, whoops. Remnants of the original prairies are left in Oakland Town, in, uh, left in Oakland Township, and they're like 99% of them are gone, I believe, something like that. But the rest of the little remnants are scary. Many of them are scattered along the Paint Creek Trail. Remember that I mentioned that our native plant, plants are adapted to fire. Ironically, these remnant prairies exist because of repeated fires started from the sparks that came off the train tracks. You know how the metal on metal? When I was young, Oakland Township had no fire department. And so residents would have to go out with brooms and shovels to put out the blaze. These periodic fires, though, allowed these rare sun loving plants to receive a bit more sunlight because they discouraged, they burnt some of the non native plants that were moving in but weren't fire adapted. And so the native survivors got a little bit more sun and they sort of struggled on until somebody came to rescue them. Eventually, of course, the railroad tracks were removed and the tracks became the Paint Creek Trail. But that inspiring story is for another day. In 2022, after discovering many unusual plants occurring in and around the wet prairie, the Oakland Township Parks and Recreation Commission used our local land preservation millage yay, land preservation millage, along with grants from the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund, and they bought a 10-acre parcel next to the old railroad bed. 2005 and six, they decided to do their first professional plant survey on that piece of property. Now, botanists doing professional surveys evaluate each individual species on a site according to how indicative their presence is of a high-quality natural area that deserves preservation and restoration. They named the score given to each species, the plant's coefficient of conservatism. That's a pretty big mouthful, so I'm gonna just call it the plant's conservation score, okay? Or the C-score, if I say that, sometimes you'll know what I mean. So this is the, explains kind of how that's done. Kind of follow through with me, Ken. Each individual species that they find is given a conservation score from one to 10. Non-native plants are given a zero because they never occurred in, you know, around here naturally. A conservation score of one is a native plant of species that grows just about anywhere, parking lots, roadsides, et cetera. But a score of 10 of any species would be one that's uncommon or indicates a very special habitat that needs to be preserved and restored. Then the individual scores of each plant are combined to make what's called the floristic quality index for that area. It's an overall indication of the importance of the area for conservation. A floristic quality index of one to 19 indicates that the area is full of non-native or very common plants might thrive in roadside ditches. 
a score of 20 to 35, a little bit higher quality. Any score over 35, plants that botanists consider significant on a statewide level. And any score over 50, which is rare, indicates an exceptional area with, quote, irreplaceable diversity. And look at the wet prairie score. It told the tale it scored 60.42. It was 10 points above 50. So it was a good purchase, to say the least. A very high quality area that needed both preservation and restoration. So let me show you some of the plants they found early on that got the Parks Department all excited about this piece of land. Here is Hori Pacoon, which still grows uh, along the, the uh, Paint Creek Trail and has a con and we're taking good care of it. It has a conservation score of 10 out of 10. It got a perfect score in terms of being an important plant. Grass of Parnassus scored eight out of 10 on the conservation scale. A field of wild, wild lupin grew near the wet prairie in the 70s. Somebody took a picture. It earns a conservation score of seven. There's some of it still around and we're taking good care of it, trying to keep it there. In 2006, volunteers and park staff tried to reduce the number of invasive shrubs crowding the prairie. Now, I have to just stop and say volunteers are still crucial in conservation work today. We have only two full-time staff, Ben and our wonderful stewardship specialist at the back there, Grant Vanderland, along with three summer interns. They are responsible for 1,500 acres of land. So you can imagine that every volunteer gets a lot of appreciation from the stewardship crew. So if you want to be appreciated, come volunteer. If you're feeling unappreciated, this is the place to feel appreciated. In 2008, the first prescribed burn started nourishing the surviving plants, the native plants, and discouraging the non-native plants that aren't used to periodic fire. But when Ben was hired in 2014, the restoration of the wet prairie had been kind of spotty for about five years. So trees and shrubs had again crept in, shading out the special plants in the prairie. So the stewardship team knew what they had to, what was missing at the prairie was fire. So they began again with a prescribed burn in 2014. Now prescribed burns are done only with professionals or trained volunteers. And I, I wanna just, um, if I just click on this, Ben, will that bring it up? Yeah. Um, ben designs the fire to burn inward toward the center of the burn unit. So first they begin by creating burn breaks around the burn unit. Then crew members, whoops, I did, did it again, didn't I, sorry. Crew members with backpack water tanks constantly surround the fire and a slow burn is planned for only part of the park at any one time. So that gives wildlife time to smell the smoke and move to safer areas. And they do that. I have seen all kinds of little creatures finding their way to the places in the park where they know how to get safe. They lived with fire for thousands of years too. Neighbors are notified ahead of time about a burn in their area. Ben and Grant also began removing several large cottonwoods and aspens around the edge of the prairie to bring back the sunlight that the surviving native plants needed. Now, if you notice the inset there, Ben carefully paints the edges of the stump with a dyed herbicide to prevent resprouting from the roots. This is especially important for hot cottonwoods and aspens because they spread quickly. Even though both are native, they need to be removed in rare habitats like the wet prairie to help the native survivors flourish. Now, like you, I bet that bothered me at first. You know, why cut any tree was kind of my, my premise, or why certainly why cut any native tree? Didn't get it at first. But I finally learned, I became to the conclusion that this was a lot like me thinning plants I love in my garden, or even eliminating them if they crowd out or they shade out other plants that we value. So I decided Ben and Grant were managing 1500 acres of garden and it was okay. You might see parks volunteers occasionally collecting seed on the wet prairie, and most of those seeds stay on the wet prairie. They're sown where trees and shrubs have been removed or where the native vegetation has become kind of sparse. So the wet prairie is a classic restoration, a place where the native plants have survived against incredible odds. We help them flourish by simply adding, simply adding more of what naturally occurred there. So now let me introduce you to the plants of the wet prairie. Now there are upland prairie plants that you'll see in any prairie around the edge of the prairie. Here you see some black-eyed Susans, bee balm, butterfly, wheat, milkweed, smooth aster, New England aster. One of my big faves grows there, the elegant native Michigan lily. Don't you love that we have a beautiful lily named after us? 
It has a conservation score of five, much more dramatic than the invasive tiger lily, which I used to see in roadside ditches when I was a kid. Now let me show you the kind of more unusual ones. Here's this white plant is turtle head. It scores a seven on the 10 point conservation scale. Cylindrical blazing star, looks like something out of Van Gogh, doesn't it? Has a conservation score of five, but is rarely seen in the growing numbers of them that we now see in the wet prairie since restoration began. Bottle gentians. What you are seeing in this picture is the blossom, not the bud. These do not open. So it's almost exclusively pollinated by big burly bumblebees who force their way into that, that blossom, buzz vigorously, they call it buzz pollinating, creating a cloud of pollen that settles on their fuzzy bodies and then they shoot out and they take all the good pollen with them. These very cool natives have a score of five out of 10. Harebells have a conservation score of six. They're a favorite of many of our native small bees. Uh, something to know about them is that there are seven in Michigan, never seven harebells in Michigan that are what are called native ours. And native ours are a native plant, but they've been cultivated by horticulturists for a specific trait, like a different color or a double blossom or even a different scent. And many native ours are sterile and they don't produce pollen. They don't even produce nectar. And often the pollinators, unfortunately, don't even recognize them as their plant because they go a lot by scent and also by shape and color. So this one, however, is a native one, and it's one of three native harebells in Michigan. These are fringe gentians. They score eight out of 10 on the conservation scale. And last summer, they were like little fountains of purple all over the wet prairie in August and September. Years ago, I found one lonely bloom. I took a picture of it, of grass of Parnassus, and tried to figure out what it was long before I met Ben. And if you look at it now, it is spreading across the wet prairie last fall. It scores an eight out of 10 on that scale. False asphodel, little tiny plant, perfect score, 10 out of 10. In early bloom, it has these red anthers and red sepals cover the seed pods till they ripen and eventually fall. Here's shrubby cinquefoil, another perfect score. 10 out of 10 comes back every year on the wet prairie. This is prairie loose strife. It has, it's a good loose strife, not the purple loose strife. This is prairie loose strife. It has these little shy nodding blossoms and it scores 10 out of 10. And here it is if you want to see it and a little little face that you can't really see in this, usually. Ladies' tresses is one of nine Michigan orchids, and a tiny but a very special one. It scores nine out of 10 on the conservation scale, and it's one of two orchids that appear in the wet prairie. The other is yellow lady slipper, which scores five out of 10. Now, never tell your children, please, to never try, try to pick or try to transplant an orchid. It can take them years before roots and shoots develop. So. Just leave them where they are and admire them. This is common blue-eyed grass, but it's not common anymore. And it's not a grass, it's a lovely, delicate little wildflower. And it has, has a score of seven out of 10. Now with all those guys showing up on the prairie with these high scores, we started to get more pollinators on the prairie. And so now we're getting, here's the common buckeye butterfly, who I like a lot. Here's the silver spotted skipper, who's on a native Joe pie. Here's the great spangled fritillary on smooth aster at the wet prairie. Here's a tiny little eastern tail blue butterfly. Here's the orange sulfur butterfly having, heading towards some native smooth aster. I like this cut because it's such a weird one. This is white lettuce growing above the uh, Pay Creek at the, at the wet prairie. It has a conservation score of five, but can you see that there are two native bumblebees pollinating it if you can't? Let me click again and you'll see the one on the left. There's his rear end kind of sticking out of the bottom of the blossom. He's busy trying to get what he can from that little flower. Whoops, and of course, butterfly milkweed dots the prairie too, attracting lots of pollinators. Can you see down below the blossom there? There's a caterpillar, orange and brown. That's an unexpected cycnea moth caterpillar. Love that name too. It was unexpected to me, I'll tell you that when I saw it. Most moths, by the way, have the night shift in pollination. Uh, butterflies hold down the day shift, moths hold down the night shift. And then on this plant also, I saw the great golden digger wasp. It's not a very good pollinator because his body is a little too smooth to be a good pollinator, but he does leave offspring for others to eat. And then of course, the monarch whose caterpillars can only survive on milkweed. 
So that's the sunny, wet prairie. Now, let's take a quick look at the restoration of the woods north of the prairie where the creek used to be. It was frankly a mess. This is a picture along the trail north of the wet prairie, non-native shrubs and vines just blanketing the whole area. Ben had a contractor do a burn here, but the ground was too moist and the underwood brush was too dense and it would never get a good burn. So he paid a, a contractor who brought in an invasive shrub mower to just do the edge along the trail where it was firmer and drier. And look what he accomplished in a few days, which would have taken the crew months to do with hand tools. And here's what happened. A profusion of golden Alexanders appeared up out of the ground. None of this was seeded. These, these seeds were waiting underneath all those shrubs and vines for decades, maybe 50 years, maybe 100 years, who knows? And they had never gotten the sun or the rain. Suddenly they got the sun or the rain and they appeared. Now they won't look like this forever because they're kind of doing a Yahoo and then they'll kind of slow down after that. Other things will move in with them, hopefully. Here's one up close if you want to see them. Now the interior of the woods wasn't much better. It's also choked, was choked with invasive shrubs and vines, but there the soil was too fragile and too wet to bring in heavy machinery. And besides, Ben really wanted to kind of be gentle with this piece of land so you could see what might come up on its own once the land could breathe again. So the work had to be done with hand tools by Ben and Grant and volunteers like Ian Abelson of Six Rivers Land Conservancy. And then they pile them under the open areas in the tree canopy so that the trees won't be affected by the, uh, by the flames. And it took three months for them to clear this area from December to February of 2021-22. These huge piles were all along the edge of that ancient uh, original stream bed of Paint Creek. And in January, they set the piles ablaze. They do this every January because they can put them on a snowy surface and it doesn't bother anything else. And in planning a prescribed burn, Ben tries to choose a day in which the wind conditions allow the smoke to go directly upward as much as possible. So the smoke doesn't bother residents and their animals who are living nearby. Here's a volunteer who's here tonight, George Hartzig, who's become an expert about native seed in just the last year. And he is sowing it in the woods here after it was gathered on the wet prairie. So let's see which plants emerged on their own after the restoration got going in the, in the wet prairie woodland. Riverbank wild rye appeared right where it should have been. It was on the riverbank of Paint Creek, the old Paint Creek. Here was this little plant, been there since probably, it has a conservation score of eight, which would indicate that it may have flourished along Bear Creek before the stream was ever moved 150 years ago. So it's been hanging out waiting for us to know that it was there. Native plants are really tough survivors. You can hardly kill those little stinkers. They're amazing. If you afterwards, if anybody asks me, I'm going to tell you the story about my poke milkweed and its ability to come back from disaster. After the removal of invasives, the ancient creek bed was full of marsh marigolds, which have a conservation score of six. And you can see the flush of green that's emerging on the forest floor in the background where the sun is beginning to reach it. Ben found this nodding beggar tick in the woods way back in 2014. Last year, it was blooming in large areas of that former creek, creek bed of Paint Creek, taking advantage of the moisture there. And then there was a monarch who thought she'd take advantage of the nodding beggar tick. Golden ragwort, a bright orange and yellow native with a conservation score of five out of 10, really got going in 2022 when two of Ben's stewardship interns posed for this photo. These are the fall capsules of a pretty unassuming little plant, which some people in here I know have in their gardens. It's called late figwort. It was beloved by bees, despite its teeny tiny reddish brown flowers that barely protrude from the bud. I mean, it's amazing that the bees ever discovered this, but they love it. It has a conservation score of five. This is New England aster, which is not an unusual native plant, conservation score of three out of 10, but it's an unusual color for it. It's usually lavender, sometimes white. Probably the mineral rich water may have changed the color of the plant. Riddle's goldenrod in the wood has a conservation score of seven out of 10. Goldenrods are great for pollinators and this one loves the moist shade of a woodland. Bone set hosts, hosts lots of moths in the nighttime hours when its white flowers can more easily be seen than other flowers. And by the way, these are not the same moths who get into your grain cupboard or your clothing. These are outdoor moths who forage outdoors. So we can have all the moths we want as long as we don't get those miserable ones that get in your house, the little tiny house moths. 
One of the tasks, though, in restoring a woodland can be thinning the tree canopy. When an oak forest, for example, has been neglected for long periods of time, smaller invasive or even native but aggressive trees can begin to fill in in the woods. And this makes the forest floor too shady for the native woodland plants that love dappled light, like little oaks or woodland flowers like wood anemone, for example. And if you cut down a lot of smaller trees in the forest at once, it could disturb or shock the whole system. So you don't want to do that. And you can't remove trees in his forest with large machinery easily because it will harm the forest floor that you're trying to bring back because you're trying to bring back both the trees and the forest floor. So in that case, the crew will girdle trees by removing a strip of bark around the trunk as the intern on the right is doing here. If you girdle trees, they die, but at slower and faster rates depending on their size. And the rest of the forest can tolerate that lower pace of change. They're used to things dying. They just don't want a whole bunch of trees around them to die at once. And you guessed it, Ben guessed it too. It also bothered me to watch this initially. But again, what I came to accept is that this is a slower, more gentle way to thin a forest, to open its canopy, let sunlight reach the forest floor, restore and revive the, 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 key, the nature's keystone species like the, the oaks, as well as other woodland natives. So here's a thinned canopy with lots of green up there, but spaces for sunlight to reach the forest floor. And here's our first good omen. In the spring of 2022, look who showed up, the red-headed woodpecker who loves forest with an open canopy. So we're hoping he'll bring his friends over the next few years. And here's the forest floor last fall in 2023, quite a transformation from a tangle of non-native shrubs and vines. Now, in these last few minutes, just let me show you the second kind of restoration. This is Charles Ilsley Park before restoration in 2014. It was an abandoned farm field full of agricultural grasses, other kinds of non-native grasses, and clumps of invasive autumn olive. If no res restoration had occurred in this field, today, 10 years later, it would be blanketed with autumn olive and other invasive shrubs. If you don't believe me, look along M24 when you're driving towards Oxford. It's a constant, or beyond Oxford, it's even worse, just a constant wall of invasive shrubs in the fields that have been neglected there for so long. For so many years, this field had been agricultural, either crops or cattle, that native plants no longer emerged from the seed bank. It was a great opportunity to create or recreate a tall grass prairie through seeding. Invasive shrubs were removed, the stumps were treated, uh, followed by a series of prescribed burns because it did had so much agricultural stuff in it for so long. And then it was finally sown with Michigan native seed. And here's what it looked like in 2018. A wide diversity of wildflowers, including coneflower and black-eyed Susan and bee balm and native grasses, switchgrass, Indian grass. What a thrill it was. And Lori, who's in the back, and I were just talking about this on Wednesday at Birdwalk. That first spring, it was just exquisite. It was amazing and we couldn't believe it. And what a result for the stewardship crew who had spent four years trying to get this to happen. This last summer in 2023, with the return of all the native wildflowers, like this fall sunflower that was everywhere this summer in that, in that meadow and bee balm, the meadow at Ellesley Park, it was just buzzing and fluttering with pollinators. Here's the hover or surfed fly on false sunflower. It evolved to look like a bee because it was convenient to not have the design that gets you, a design like this doesn't get you eaten very often. This is a Katie did nymph on false sunflower. This is the native bumblebee on native bee balm, a false milkweed beetle on false sunflower. They're actually real flowers. They just have a weird name. Let Ben explain that to you. Last summer and fall, the prairies here were dancing with monarch butterflies and great spangled fritillaries like this one on bee balm. I think I saw about a dozen fritillaries and five monarchs in like a 10 minute walk. Now in Isley, Isley Central Prairie, Ben worked to break the old drainage tiles that the farmer had put in. And a series of wetlands, just like magic, rose again under the slope of a hill. And this summer, rose or swamp milkweed filled that moist area and it was so beautiful and a female monarch was 
foraging there. And a good thing she was, because nearby there was a male monarch who hung out nearby, hoping to get her attention. Now you can tell he's a male monarch because of the two bulges on the veins on his hind wings. If you see those bulges, you know you're looking at a male monarch. The common milkweed that was growing up around the edge of this wetland attracted a host of pollinators too, and many of them sported the orange and black colors of the monarch to warn predators that they can eat the milkweed's potent toxin too and stay away. Works very nicely for the red admiral butterfly, the red milkweed beetle, the large milkweed beetle. The common milkweeds were also buzzing with dozens of European honeybees. Now, you know, the honeybees are all non-native. They were brought here, but we have lots of native bees too. So I just want to show you at the end here three pictures taken by my friend Aaron, uh, who helps me with the blog sometimes. This is his picture of the indigo bunting. These are the kind of birds we love that show up to eat all those uh, wonderful caterpillars. Here's the scarlet tanager, and here's the blue-winged warbler. He had an insect right in his beak. We were hoping he was taking it to a nest, but we don't know for sure. In an online workshop in 2022, I heard a quote by Donald Falk, a professor at the University of Arizona that captures what excites me about restoration and stewardship. He said, restoration uses the past, not as a goal, but as a reference point for the future. If we seek to recreate the temperate forests, the tall grass savannas, or the desert communities of centuries past, it is not to turn back the evolutionary clock, but to set it ticking again. And it seems that we humans, unwittingly, even with the best of intentions, have altered and interrupted a complex set of ancient, uh, highly varied, uh, ancient intricate relationships in nature that supported a healthy, highly varied habitat for thousands of years. So in Oakland Township, we are lending nature a helping hand, letting it get back to work at filling our parks, our gardens, our natural areas with diverse native habitats to support the birds, the animals, the insects that share nature's bounty with us. I'm grateful to share in that effort and for your presence here tonight that allowed me to share it with you. Thank you. So does anybody have any questions? I went so fast, you hope you, hope you got all that. Yeah. Could you explain why oak trees are so important to um, sure. eating yeah. up? Um, yeah, oak trees are like, they call them the keystone species for all of North America, and they're particularly the keystone species for Michigan. And the reason is they feed more insects than any other species of tree by far. They are over almost 500, I believe somewhere between four and 500 species live up at the tops of those oaks. And when you hear Doug telling me talk about it, one of the wonderful things he says, he says, and a lady came up to me once and she said, well, I don't want to put some tree in my yard that has holes all over its leaves. <laughs> and he said, I've got a 10 point program for that. You take 10 steps back from an oak tree and you'll never see a hole in the leaf. <laughs> But they do, they're way up in the trees. I have them all around my house. I, I, I do not notice the holes in the leaves. So, uh, but that's what they're doing. They're hosting more. Maples are the next one down and maples are like down in the what, three, 300s or 200, somewhere in there, 250, 300 uh, in species they can do. And then you get plants like, mm, you know, give me an example, Ben. Well, any, any a lot of species have been here for a hundred years and they still might, support one species if we're lucky. Many of them don't support any species. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't you just repeat yeah. their question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the first question was, what's so important about oak trees? And this question from Eugenia is next. Okay. No, trillium is wonderful. Trillium is a lovely native flower. And as a matter of fact, when I did a history of Bear Creek, um, because a man who lived there in the 1930s during the Depression wrote, she wanted to know about Trillium and if they were still around. Um, he, he wrote about living at Bear Creek during the Great Depression, and he made a 600-page book, which you can look at in the library. So I did a piece on its history. At that time, there were red and white Trillium growing all the way down the slopes of those steep uh, hills by the marsh, by the Bear Creek Marsh. 
they're, they're still there in very small numbers. The problem for Trillium is deer. Deer just mow them down. They just absolutely love Trillium. We have too many deer. There's just no doubt about it. They don't have a native predator. So I've changed my mind about hunting in the last nine years. <laughs> Any other questions that anybody has? Yeah. This is Louise. Go ahead. Would you describe the stewardship program? <clears throat> is that what you were doing this in conjunction? Oh, the conservation stewardship? Perhaps. Okay. Yeah, this fall or this summer and fall, some of us uh, volunteers, about four of us in, in Ben's group, um, all signed up to take a course called the Conservation Steward Program. It's run by the MNFI, the Michigan Natural Features Inventory, and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, is it? No, by the Michigan State's Extension Service. And they organize it by county, and they do it uh, every two years in Oakland County, and they alternate different counties, different years. And you go for, somebody help me, was it seven weeks we went to that class? I think something like that. Erin, is it seven weeks? Yeah. Um, and we go at night uh, on Wednesdays for three hours and half of that time, and it would be in a different location. This year, it was in a different location every year. So we got to see a wetland and these wet forest and prairie and, you know, rivers and lakes and stuff. And in each case, we had a lesson to do at home online. And then we had uh, this class on Wednesday night and you would have the class be from six to nine. Half the class would be um, going out somewhere with an expert from some field to show you something. And then the other half of the night would be like a, a PowerPoint with more dense information in it. And uh, then we had some field trips. We had to do, I think it was two half day, two half day field trips, I think in one full day. And those were the specific um, habitats too. It's a really great program, very demanding time-wise. And you have to do a project at the end and making the first version of this was my project. So that was part of what motivated me to suffer through Microsoft again after being an Apple person for 20 years or so. So, and my husband listened to a lot of unsavory language. And so, so. Does anybody else have a question? Yeah, Michael. Yeah. And Ben could probably answer that, Ben. Um, Michael would like to know if the score was 60.42 for the wet prairie. Is there any other place you could look up the floristic index for a particular piece of land? Yeah. Just get a little closer to the computer for the folks at home. Um, <laughs> so, for at least for our parks, I do plant surveys in them, and I haven't really posted the like the final results online. Um, but I have that if you're interested. So, um, and if I, uh, as I update management plans, some of those are available for like example, Draper Tilnix Park, you can go out online and find that one now since the park commission reviewed that in the last yeah. year. And then the Michigan Natural so. Features Inventory just did a survey of Fox Nature Preserve right. and it has a floristic quality index for some of the areas of that yep. uh, park as well. They ranged from, I remember from the, Mid twenties to the mid thirties, I think some places in eight park. Yeah, you had a couple in the forties. Were there a couple Just, in the forties? Yeah. Oh, good. High thirty eight. So. Okay, okay, great. I didn't come across it. That's good. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, we're, oh yeah, go ahead. Jen. How do you get rid of bittersweet? Uh, ben, you want to give them the bittersweet talk? <laughs> good luck getting rid of bittersweet. Yeah. First, I'll make a Christmas tree with it. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and then throw it in your backyard. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. So if you have it binding up your trees, you can uh, typically just some of them. You know, the roots are pretty fragile, so if it's a single right. vine, sometimes you can just extract the root and then stay on top of it. Um, if it's a bigger area, though, you're probably gonna have to cut the the stem and then treat the stump somehow. It's a herbicide of some kind. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, Sometimes if you just have a couple folks have even found that you can put like a dark, um, like a trash bag type thing over it and then you just have to leave it for a couple of years until it ends up dying. Um, I recommend really the herbicide. Plastic thing. waste in the woods and other issues associated with that. So we end up using, um, you know, cutting the stump down low and then treating it. And then typically you have to go back through the following year again and do like a, a very targeted treatment to any re-sprouts we find. 
So yeah. they just have to stay on top of it for a long time. Invasive things in general are hard to get rid of, but invasive bill of suite is a real stinker. No doubt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, ben, how does it spread? Bittersweet? Yeah. Birds. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's, uh, I think Cam's alluded to this. Um, a lot of our native shrubs, um, our birds have evolved with, so it feeds them. It's like taking or eating a complete meal. Um, our invasive shrubs, the birds will eat them, but it's like eating junk food. So it doesn't give them a complete nutrition, and they end up malnourished from eating invasive berries. Yeah. Um, so they eat the bittersweet and they spread around like crazy. But from the science that I've read, or read anyway, um, it doesn't give them a complete meal, and it you know they don't reproduce as well when there's a lot of invasive shrubs around. Right. And they have other issues. So. Right. So yeah, yeah birds spread them around. So. Yeah. If, only, if only birds didn't poop, we'd be in great shape. <laughs> they do. So, um, any other questions? Okay. Were there any that that day didn't come in? Somebody have one? Oh, here. Oh, yeah. I'm just kind of curious. Um, you know, the progress that uh, parks have made uh, in this area is just incredible. Um, over the last 10, 15 years, what changes have been noticed in public awareness? Um, oh, hey, you to know if the public has become more aware well all of you are here tonight which is a pretty pretty happy sign um of, of native plants or what the progress has been in the township in terms of conservation i'd say I, i'd say it's improved but it could be a lot better um we could probably do more promotion so i want all of you to go out and talk about all the wonderful work that old township is doing and work hard on the getting out whenever the millage comes up to get it reproved i think that's probably the biggest place that i think of we had the first millage in what the mid 70s i think and it's passed every every however many years it goes for each time over and over again which means that people understand preserving the land they don't always have as much understanding yet of why they need to restore the land. And that's kind of what I was trying to talk about tonight because it's it's one thing to put a fence around your piece of property and keep it, but it's another to try to turn it into something that's actually feeding the habitat and feeding all the animals and the critters that live inside that fence, you know? So that is taking a long time to get across everywhere, I think. We're just, right now, native plant nurseries are spreading. I think that's a really good sign. Um, I've been invited to speak to so far two um, garden clubs who want to talk about native plants. So I think it's beginning to be, beginning to it's getting out there, but it's gonna, it's it could have a lot more good PR, no doubt about it. Anybody else have a question? Okay, I think we're finished. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight, everyone. Hope to see you back here again uh, February 15. And let's go ahead and thank him one more time. That was awesome.